Morning, everybody. Thelma, it's great to have you back in the house of God. <laughs> Thank you all for being in the house of God with me today. Um, you know, when you signed up for this, you signed up to walk a narrow road. And I'm just thankful for people that are willing to walk the narrow road with me. Even rock and roll agrees that there's a highway to hell and a stairway to heaven. So uh, we know we're signing up for the, the narrow road. But I'm thankful for my church family to do that with today. We're going to continue a series that I've been on for quite a while called The Seated Life. And just what it means for us to be seated with Christ. And, and I thought of this and I thought, well, I don't know if I should open the, the opportunity up, but maybe I should. Just if there's anybody in the room that has a word of what it's meant as you've if you've gone through this study and, and thought about what's it mean to be seated with Christ, is there a word that comes to mind? Well, the last message, <clears throat> we talked about that it means we, we ought to be satisfied. We ought to find satisfaction in our day-to-day -day life. And that's, that's sometimes easier said than done. You know, the Christian life has these platitudes of what life should be like, but the experience isn't always like the, the ideal itself. And to know that we're seated with Christ, that because Jesus finished his work and sat down and we are seated with him, means that we can find fulfillment and we can find contentment. Now, we might have to look for it a little bit. We might have to sometimes strain a little bit. We might have to have a focus about ourselves, but it's there. Amen? I mean, Paul even admitted that without Jesus, it was next to impossible. But with him, this famous verse came about in Philippians 4, 12 and 13. Paul says, I know how to get along with little and how also to live in prosperity. And in every in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry or whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, and in my translation, that means I can be satisfied through him who gives me strength. Now, as we said, the challenge is that our condition day-to-day -day would match the position of being seated with Christ, the position of being content and fully satisfied finding fulfillment. Jesus warns us that in this world you will have trouble. We know how to finish that statement. We've heard it enough and we've lived it. Paul says that outwardly we are wasting away. We're wasting away in this body of death. And Peter warns that we are going to suffer grief through various trials. So satisfaction is going to start with our devotion to Jesus, a dedication to follow him if it's going to have a duration to it. And we're going to go back to the book of Ruth. We're going to go to the book of Ruth for truth. Is that okay? There's more to glean, no pun intended, but there is more here uh, than when I first covered it uh, about six weeks ago. The context of this little four-chapter book takes place during a period of the judges. And if you look at the, the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua... Then it goes into Judges and Ruth before it picks up with First and Second Chronicles, Kings, and First and Second Samuel, of course. So this period from when Joshua died and the promised land was secured for God's people to the point when they wanted a king, and so God gave them Saul as their first king. That period of time is best summarized. It was a dark period in, in, in uh, Israel's past, and it's best summarized with this verse that's several times in the book of Judges, and I pick the one, the last verse of the book of Judges, says that in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes, or as they saw fit. And so you don't have to have much imagination to realize, yeah, it went, it went south pretty quickly for God's people. And then when they repented, then a hero, God brought a hero, a judge, to restore and bring them back, but then it went south again. And they were just on this sin cycle. Um, and, but that's when this book of Ruth was given to us. 
And we highlighted this Moabitess, this young girl from Moab named Ruth. And we looked at her devotion to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and likened it to our devotion, of course, to Jesus. Her dedication to do for the family, and then her duration. There's a reason that the book is entitled Ruth and not Orpah, her, her sister-in-law. And we'll, we'll talk about that again. But the story begins with a family on the move. In Ruth chapter 1, we realize there was a famine in Bethlehem, that God's people do suffer, that bad things happen to God's children and to, quote, good people. We don't want to go there, but whether you're a Christian or not, we're living in this world and bad times come. And so this man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi had two boys, and they had to make a real hard decision to, to stay with the others or to leave and, and try to find satisfaction, try to find sustenance or daily bread. So after they decided to leave and they went to this country of Moab, Elimelech, the father of the family, dies. In that time, the boys find two girls and they get married. But then in a short time later, the boys die. So here's Naomi who lost her husband and her two sons in a matter of about 10 years. And in this time, she decides after she hears that God had come to the relief of his people that the famine is over and there's crops growing and there's going to be a harvest soon, she decides to go back home. But yet she has these two daughter-in-laws and I think it really shows her heart because these girls were willing to go with her. These girls would have been a great source of support and help to her. But in Ruth chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, we see really the, the heart of Naomi. And it says that Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go and return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may have a place of rest, each one in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they raised their voices, and they wept. To me, such an unselfish thing for Naomi to do. She could have had those girls come with her. They certainly would have gone. They would have been a great source of help to her, but she knew what was best for them was probably to return to their own families. This was genuine love for another person. Well, here's where we pointed out Ruth's devotion. See, these girls had a choice. They could, they could go to Bethlehem, which meant God plus nothing else, or they could return home, which meant they, they got everything minus God. So Orpah's decision was to choose to go back to her family. So she stayed in Moab. But Ruth's decision was to cling to Naomi and to go with her to Bethlehem. A verse that I'd like to read that shows this clear devotion is in verses 16 and 17 of Ruth chapter 1. Ruth said, do not plead with me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you sleep, I will sleep. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and worse, if anything but death separates me from you. This was truly a devotion that Ruth had in her heart. And the first point I'd like to make here is that when we decide who is when we decide where. Ruth chose Naomi. And she chose Naomi's God. And she chose Naomi's country. And she chose every, everything about Naomi. And that set the course for her life. When you choose who, you choose where. Jesus told us to consider the cost that it would be to follow Him. The simplest yet hardest decision that we as Christians have to make is, are we going to follow Him? When we choose Jesus, we choose where He wants to take us. We give up our right to ourself to plan out our life. We submit in humility to Him as our Lord. Not just our Savior, our Lord. And where our Lord leads us, that is where we are supposed to go. That's a real death to the flesh. But that's devotion. And that's counting the cost of what it's going to confess Christ as Lord. Ruth decided that she was going to follow her mother-in-law Naomi. And we all have to make that decision. Are we going to follow Jesus? Following certain crowds is going to take us to certain places. So we need to consider carefully who we are going to get yoked with. We need to consider carefully who we are going to get into business agreements with and into marriage arrangements with because when we decide who, we decide 
where. Secondly, God builds our life on who stays, not on who leaves. The book of Ruth is called that because she stayed. She didn't leave. So don't look back at your life and envy any part of your past or wonder why people left your life or why people left your business or why people left your ministry or why people left in general. Maybe God brought them in for a reason. Maybe God brought them in for a season and then it was time for them to move on because God will bring into your life those whom He wants to use to build. And He will allow to go those who He used for a reason and now it's time for them to go. So God builds our life on who stays and that was certainly the case for Naomi and Ruth staying with her. So the girls get back to Bethlehem and Naomi isn't the same person as when she left. In chapter 1, verses 19 to 21, it says, So when they went on until they came to Bethlehem, and when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. This woman is still deep in the grieving process. She's had her heart broken. Have you been there? You know, she's identifying herself with her circumstance at the present time. Naomi connotated pleasantness, and Mara means bitter. And that's exactly the taste in her mouth. That is exactly the experience at this point in her life. Truly bitterness. And you know, if we will judge life as it's happening, we will call ourselves by what we are going through. We will say, I am sad. We will say, I am fearful. We will say, I am angry. I am jealous. I am inadequate. I am not enough. Whatever the situation is that we're going through at that time, if we judge it just in that time, we'll begin to identify ourselves with that. Now, Paul said, judge no thing before the appointed time. Now, in our last message, I was talking about a perspective we have to have when we're in a time in our life when things do taste a little bitter. Like God's putting together a meal. But see, we live it ingredient by ingredient. And sometimes the ingredients in the kitchen that make a great tasting dish don't taste good in isolation. They don't taste good in and of themselves. In fact, some things that make a, a very tasty dish are very bitter when you just taste that one single ingredient. Paul said that in all things, God works together for good. And we have to, we have to really break down that verse the appropriate way. We have to allow God to work all things together and trust Him for the good that He is going to bring out of that. Because single events certainly aren't all good. We cannot say that every event that we go through is good. Praise God, this is good. No, it's not. This is hard. This is, this is very bitter. This, this is tough. But I'm trusting that with time, God's going to use this time in my life and the next times in my life, and He's going to work it all together for something good. According to His purpose. Let's not leave that out. Not our plans. According to my plans, this stinks. This is not what I want. This is not what I envision. But I'm trusting in His purposes that He's going to work this event right now that's very bitter, but He's going to mix it with some other ingredients that are very sweet, and He's going to make something that's beautiful for His purposes. So that's, we have to trust that God is going to bring all of these things together. You see, Naomi's calling herself bitter, and she's mad at God. Let's be real. There's times we're mad at God. Why would you allow this? How is this good in any way, God? This is the exact opposite of what I prayed for. You didn't answer my prayer, God. But at the end of the day, we have to realize that if we give God the time and we give Him everything, He's going to bring it together for good. In chapter 4, Naomi's holding a baby on her lap and they're calling her blessed. And this baby was the grandfather of King David. And the line goes all the way down to, to our King Jesus. You see, she just needed to give God a little more time and a few more ingredients. 
she had to give God time to bring Boaz on the scene. And that's who we're going to, to meet next. But God's favor was on the way. It just needed a little more time and Ruth needed to glean a little bit to find it. But the satisfaction would come again. So in chapter 2, Ruth decides, we're asking for favor. I better go out to the field and look for it. Because favor is in the field. And we just said that gleaning was that, was that action of finding things that other people miss. Seeing what others don't see. We talked about four principles of gleaning. That number one, you'll always find what you're looking for. If you want to find something to complain about, you'll find it. If you want to find something to be thankful about, you can find it. If you want to find something to be angry about, you'll find it. If you want to find a reason to hold on and not forgive, you can find it. Or to forgive, you will find it. But we'll find what we're looking for. Number two, gleaning sometimes, and most importantly, is happening while we're still grieving. And that was true in these girls' lives. They had to glean as they were still grieving the loss of of the, the father of the family and, and the two boys. And many times in our life, that's the most important time that we have to glean. We have to search for good in the times that we feel nothing and taste nothing but bitterness. We have to look for it because it's there. Many times it takes a humble heart and, and Ruth's heart was so humble. She says, I'm going to go out and find favor in anyone in whose eyes I can find favor. And when Boaz recognizes her and gives her that favor, she falls on her knees and says, why have I found such favor in your eyes? She was so humble and so appreciative of the little that he did for her. It was huge in her eyes. And with a humble heart, every little blessing will be huge. And we'll be so thankful. But a prideful heart will feel entitled. A prideful heart will find reason to complain. A prideful heart will say, yeah, but... And we'll always find why that's not good enough. A prideful heart will leave us ungrateful. And we said that we have to have a mind that's set on a mission. Eyes that are focused. We have to see through the weeds of sin and the weeds of, of just this flesh. And we have to find those nuggets of blessing and favor that God will always leave us. And so we meet this, this Boaz character in the very first verse, the, the writer kind of leaves it hanging out there for, for a minute. And he says in chapter 2, verse 1, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing or of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So he introduces this character because obviously he's going to be pretty important to this redemption story in just a minute. But then we also acknowledge providence. In verses 3 and 4 of chapter 2, we see God working out miracles in just the mundane, in just the daily lives, and just the things that we oftentimes don't count as miracles, but God was there, and God was working. You know, man plans his course, but God is who orders our steps. And so in verses 3 and 4, we read, So she left, and this is Ruth, to glean in the field after the reapers. And as it turned out, that's the first providence indicator right there. She happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. She could have went to any field, but yet, as it turned out, she went to a guy related to Elimelech. Verse 4, just then Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, may the Lord be with you. And they said, the Lord bless you. Just then, as it turned out, this is God ordering the steps of Ruth ordering the steps of Boaz, so they just miraculously met in this field. You know, in the last sermon that uh, I preached on this was the day before my dad had a major stroke. And I must admit, the last six weeks have been hard. The last six weeks have tasted bitter. Um, you know, we prayed for that surgery, and yet my dad had a stroke. So there, we're dealing with God choosing not to answer the way that we prayed. And we had several prayers along the way that didn't get answered the way that we thought they should. But God's provision through all of it has been unmistakable, unmistakable. And we are not going to define one single event that who we are is by this one thing that happened. We're going to give God the time to work all things together for His purposes. And it just so happens that the one variety of corn that we planted that, 
my partner, my dad, left me to pick all by myself the last six weeks. The name of the variety is Providence. And so every year that I pick, every year I pick is a reminder God has not left us. God is good. And we're not going to define our lives by this one single ingredient that we have to taste right now. We're not going to do that. Sometimes you've got to look a little harder. But His favor is always there. His blessings never let us down. So we meet Boaz in this story. And, and he's already listed as a man of great wealth, a man of standing. So he was in a position as a leader. He had, he had a lot, and he used it for God's purposes. He had property, people, he had influence. I want you to notice back in, in uh, verse 4 that we just read, as we were looking at providence, I hope you didn't miss the culture of, of Boaz's company, like the, the atmosphere that he had created. He comes to the field to his gleaners and, and his harvesters, and he said, the Lord be with you. Does anybody have a boss that greets you every day like that? Maybe you shouldn't answer out loud. I don't talk bad on your boss. But Boaz, may the Lord be with you. And they didn't go, yeah, yeah, you should come back. You didn't pay me enough last time. No. They said, the Lord bless you. Right back, the workers. This is what they think of the man that is employing them. So this man was well-liked. This man treated people the right way. And he's a respecter of persons. Um, when he notices Ruth in verse 5, Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is that? Now, my influence, or I'm not my influence, my, my uh, focus on this verse last time was Boaz said, who is that? <laughs> you know, so the flesh comes into play right there. But that's not how, it's not who is that, it's whose does that woman belong to? So Boaz was a respecter of people. He knew that she wasn't his. She wasn't a person that he could use or an asset that he could manipulate. She belonged to somebody else. Now, let me tell you, single men and young boys who date girls, listen, that young woman is not yours. She belongs to her heavenly father. She belongs to an earthly father. And until you put a ring on her finger, she is somebody else's future wife. So we need to have an awe. I'm talking to all the young boys in the room. I hope you're listening to me wherever you're sitting. She, we need to have an awe for who people are and respect that they are not ours. Boaz looked at Ruth and immediately thought, who does she belong to? So he respected her and possibly the family that she came from. Boaz was a steward of God's riches. Now looking in verses 8 through 12, a little bit lengthy, but I want to capture you know, his generous heart. Now remember, he's a man of great wealth, a man of standing. So Boaz said to Ruth, listen carefully, my daughter, do not go glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but join my young women here. Keep your eyes on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have ordered the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Then she fell on her face. This is Ruth's humility. Bowing to the ground and said, why have I found such favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner. Remember, she wasn't a Jewish girl. She's from Moab. Boaz replied to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. How you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge." Now, Boaz prays this kind of prayer of, I pray the Lord blesses you. I pray that you are richly rewarded and, and you get a full uh, payment for what you do. But guess who that blessing is going to come through? Him. So he's admitting, God's going to bless you and he's going to do it through me. God is moving my heart to take care of you. I've heard of all the things that you have done, Ruth, that show your true character, your kindness, your heart. And God wants to reward you and he's going to do it through me. Boaz, who else was Boaz? He was going to be the kinsman redeemer of Ruth and Naomi. 
And what does that mean? Let's look at verses 19 to 20. Her mother-in-law then said to her, where did you, so Ruth brings home what she got that day to Naomi. And Naomi said, where did you glean today? And where did you work? Like, that's not normal what you've brought home. May he who took notice of you be blessed, Naomi said. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness from the living and the dead. And again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our kinsmen, redeemers. So Naomi certainly has a, a turning here in her attitude from cursing God to now feeling like we have hope. When she remembers, oh yeah, Boaz, you know, he's, he's wealthy and he's related to us and he can help us. So what was a kinsman redeemer? Levitical law called for the nearest relative of a deceased man to take responsibility for keeping the family name and their land. Kinsmen redeemers would pay off debt, they would buy back land, and they would marry the widow to provide, protect, and procreate so that the name of the family of the dead person would continue on. And they wouldn't have to sell their land. The widows wouldn't have to give it away, basically, because they didn't have anything to go on. So families back then assumed responsibility for one another, something that still ought to happen today. Boaz to these women represented hope, their best and only shot at making it. So once Naomi realizes that, oh my gosh, why didn't I remember Boaz? I mean, he can help us and he's in our family. She comes up with a plan. Now we're not going to get into a bunch of chapter three. That's, you got to read that, uh, you know, in and of itself. You could probably read this in the whole book in, in about the first half of a meaningless football game today. So go home and read the entire book. Amen? Amen. But I do want to highlight in chapter 3, this is Naomi's plan for what Ruth is going to do. She's going to propose to Boaz. Boaz didn't propose to her. She proposed or asked him to be her redeemer. So in Ruth, in Ruth 3, 11 to 13, she had done what Naomi told her to do, basically asking Boaz to be their redeemer. He said, so let's read it, verse 11. So now, my daughter, this is Boaz, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you say. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Verse 12. But now, although it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is also a redeemer more closely related than I. Remain this night, and when morning comes, if he will, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not wish to redeem you, then I will redeem you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. So Boaz says, yes, Ruth. I will do it. But the honest answer is, there's a relative closer to, to you than me. And when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, no, this is, this is a love story that, that God is bringing together in his providence. He has brought these two together. And Boaz, you're pretty old, and Ruth's pretty young, and she's pretty good looking. And Boaz, what are you going to do? Why are you, why are you saying there's somebody else in line? Just take this opportunity that God is giving you. But Boaz does the right thing. He's an honorable man. And, and he says, there's someone closer than me, and if he will redeem you, good. Not, that's not good. Well, is this supposed to be you? This is your opportunity. But anyway, he does the right thing. He's an honest man. So let me ask this question. Obviously, who is Boaz ultimately picturing, describing to us? Jesus, our Redeemer. And Ruth is every single one of us. You see, Ruth is a poor, penniless, really, alien who casts herself at the feet of Boaz. And you and I are poor Gentiles, aliens, who throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus. Ruth depended on Boaz. That was her only shot for mercy to be her redeemer. And Jesus, we depend on him for mercy and our redemption. Ruth was covered by his garment as a sign that he would be her covering, her redeemer. And we are covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. Every time Ruth left Boaz, she couldn't even hardly carry the blessing of what he gave her. And every time we are in the presence of Jesus, our, our, our cup just overflows. We have so much blessing that we receive from knowing him. And when Ruth came together with Boaz, a life 
was created out of that. And when you and I are one with Christ, we are a new creation. Who Boaz was to Ruth and to Naomi is who Jesus is to us. It may be the clearest picture in the Old Testament of the Father's love for Jew and Gentile. I want you to read in Ephesians chapter 2 with me, verses 11 to 13. Paul says, therefore remember that you, and he's talking to all of us, the Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcised by the so-called circumcision, that which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel and strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, Christ Jesus, you who previ- through Christ in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So the story concludes in chapter 4. Boaz has this meeting with this man who's next of kin to Ruth and Naomi and with ten witnesses. And this guy wants the land that Elimelech had, but he doesn't want to take on Ruth, this Moabite girl. And it's a great reminder that every blessing that we want or we think we want in life is always going to come with a burden that we probably don't want. The blessings of God sometimes can be that, mixed blessings. You know, you want a car, but you're going to get a car payment with it, right? You want a puppy, but there's poop that comes with the puppy. You, <laughs> amen. You want a position, you want a title, do you want the stress that comes with that position or that title? And we'll find satisfaction when we take on the blessings and the burdens that we are asked to carry. Boaz was willing to take on everything that came with Ruth, just like Jesus has taken on everything that comes with us. And I'm going to close with this. It's so interesting, the blessing that these elders spoke over Boaz when they made this agreement official, when they said, all right, you are going to redeem Ruth and Naomi. And this is what they said in Ruth chapter 4. It starts with Boaz speaking. So Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the the hand of Naomi, all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilian and Malon. That was her two sons who died. Furthermore, I have acquired Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be eliminated from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. And you are witnesses today. And here's, and here's the blessing. And all the people who are in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathath and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the descendants whom the Lord will give you by this young woman. Make Ruth like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of the Lord. Now, if you know that story at all, you know that Jacob was pursuing Rachel. And he had to work for Rachel's dad, Laban, for seven years to get Rachel. And his father-in-law, soon to be, tricked him. And at the end of seven years, said, no, you don't get Rachel, you get Leah. He's like, what? Leah? I worked for you to get Rachel. Yes, I know. So if you want Rachel, you have to work seven more years. And that's exactly what Jacob did. And so Jacob had two wives. Jacob had two wives which, from which came the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Leah happened to be more fertile than, than Rachel was. And so they are competing, these sisters, for who can have more children. So Leah has a couple, and Rachel's panicking, so now she has her maidservant sleep with Jacob so that she can have a couple children, and Leah has a few more, and then Leah sees what Rachel's doing, so she has her maidservant sleep with Jacob, and then finally, Rachel can have a few with Jacob, and all in all, there's 12 children that come from these two competing sisters, but the blessing says, may Ruth be like Rachel and Leah, who work together. You know what? The truth is, God worked all of that together to bring about his purpose in his time. Because the actual lineage that goes back through came through Leah, not Rachel. That's the amazing part. When you hear Judah, she was a son of Leah. 
who Jacob didn't even want. He wanted her sister Rachel. But through the providence of God and the strange ways that it came about, the line goes through Leah, who bore Judah, who bore such and such, to Boaz, who found this Moabite girl, who bore a son, who was the grandfather of David. And so all that to say, God was working and is working in every single detail, all the things together. The blessings, the burdens, the things we have to glean hard to find that we got to trust God for. Think of where he brought Naomi to finally meet Boaz. And the blessings came through that whole journey. Our Boaz is Jesus Christ. And he will redeem us. And we will find satisfaction in him. But we have to trust that, Lord, I want your will and anything that comes with it, God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and how it reveals in some awesome ways, Lord, who you are and how you go about doing the miraculous in just the mundane details of our lives. God, may we con continue to glean truth and to see you working in our lives when we don't feel it, when it tastes bitter, when it feels bad. May we know that you are working everything together for the good of those who are called according to your purpose. So Lord, at the end of the day, if you are our Lord, then we want your purpose to prevail. If you are our Lord, then we want your will and everything that would come with it, Lord, to be done in our lives. Thank you for satisfying our soul. And that every single day when we find you in it, we find more reason to be content and satisfied in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's stand and enjoy a last song together before we close.